and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we are welcoming back one of my favorite foreign policy analysts, Michael Santo, and we're going to be doing our show in two parts today. The first part is going to be on the brink of World War III, number one, and the second is also on the brink of World War III, too. So you're going to get a very good um, idea of what we're going to be talking about on Russia and possibly World War III. Good morning. Good, good morning. afternoon. Good, good evening. Afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever sees the show, this is Michael Zanto. Thank you for being on the show. And before we start the show, I just want to read a little introduction, which I think is important for our guests. And it is, starts with, what does Vladimir Putin want? Vladimir Putin aims to reconstitute the, the Russia of Tsars. He wants to avenge the historic humiliation, as he sees it, that was the collapse of the Soviet Union. He got to do what he's got to do to stay in power, probably for life, if necessary, by whipping Russians into a national frenzy. All true, but maybe Mr. Putin is after a bigger game, and maybe our failure to think about how Mr. Putin thinks about himself explains our consistent failure to an anticipate his moves and check his ambitions. Michael, that is a big mouthful, and um, you know, it's you know, a lot of people really like Vladimir Putin. They feel he's strong. He's someone that we wish we had in the United States. No, no, only if you're crazy like Donald Trump. We don't, <laughs> we don't want a dictator in charge. I never thought I'd see the day where we could have a dictator in charge of the United States. We, do, we don't like Putin. We don't like what he stands for. He's hardcore, old school KGB. And, you know, one of the things that's a dawning realization for um, security analysts, generals and admirals in U.S. military, uh, European generals over the last few years, particularly with the Russian aggression in Ukraine, is what we came to believe about Russia, that it was a new Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union was wrong, that we were misguided. Um, we were but, but Michael, I just want to know, just before you start everything, is that why did people have the impression that Vladimir Putin is a friend of the United States? It seems like people think, uh, they know that he was in KGB and that he, you know, the way he thinks and, you know, he's strong and everything. But well, no, the strong is, thing is but, the nonsense of but, Trump. He's, right. he's a bad guy. Well, he's just, out to get us. It isn't just about Trump, but there's a lot of other people that think about this, too. It isn't I think Trump. that when he when when Putin murdered a former KGB guy in London with a massive dose of polonium just to shut him up, is that, that alleged? No, it's known. There's only one country that produces that amount of polonium, and it was a massive dose. We always knew it was Russians. Now, official court of an inquiry in Britain just in the last few months ruled it was Russia. Duh, it was obvious. We always knew that was FSB, which is the renamed KGB. It wasn't entirely that we mistakenly believed that uh, Putin had turned a new leaf. It was also the fact that we felt that the Russian society and that the people who ruled Russia had turned a new leaf. And one of the reasons that we were lulled into complacency is that the last Soviet leader, Gorbachev, really was our friend. So he was a very benevolent was leader. Was he our friend? Yes, 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 he clearly was. Well, um, why, why would you say, how, would, how do you differentiate between, you said he was our friend and he no, no, was we, not we, our okay, friend? We, we could distinguish by his actions. So one of the interesting things is when Reagan and Gorbachev were negotiating uh, very important arms treaties, that we actually saw efforts by the Soviet military to foil Gorbachev. So even then, he didn't entirely have control, but the Soviet Union, even under Gorbachev, even with some of the more radical things he's tried to do, and, and the moves to extend his hand of friendship to the West, to Margaret Thatcher, to Ronald Reagan, United States, Brits, and, and the overall West and NATO, um, the, 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 the political control of 
the Soviet military largely remained, but there were efforts to resist the reforms that Gorbachev was doing. Now, what we faced is the Soviet Union had, up until the late 80s, had the second largest economy in the world, and the Japanese overtook them. And they had a nuclear arsenal of about something like 50. That was United Russia. That was USSR. The Soviet Union, USSR. The Soviet, right. They had a and nuclear was, arsenal of right. about 50,000 nuclear weapons. And they reduced it to about uh, 10,000 and then about 6,000 now. Um, they, well, what happened to the United? Uh, you know, why did it break apart? Well, and that's when Putin came in. No, you had Yeltsin first, remember, in the 90s. But okay. it was an alcoholic who, we, who seemed to also have a friendly relationship with Clinton, but he increasingly had less and less control over the country, and it was under Yeltsin's rule that Putin and the other so-called Siloviki, who were the hardcore uh, former Soviet security people, assumed power, took over, and were able to remold the Russian military into a very, very substantial threat to the United States. Okay. Um, and so the way that Gorbachev reacted to the Soviet economic collapse was to push even harder friendship with the West. He was a good man. He was doing what was good for Russia. He was doing what was good for the world. Um, Reagan and Gorbachev shared a horror of nuclear weapons. First of all, they feared that it could get out of control and practically kill everyone mm -hmm. in, in the world, or at least everyone in the Soviet Union and the United States. They were terrified mm -hmm. about how close we came um, a few different times, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, but possibly even at times during the 80s for various reasons, and it terrified them. And they also felt that even though tactical nukes Battlefield nukes could be made to be "quote unquote" cleaner, where there was very little long-lasting fallout. They could have very little. So yield. cleaner nukes opposed to dirty, dirty, dirty bombs. nukes. So, so that's a confusing term, and I apologize that's a yeah. confusing because there was a lot of hype about something of very, very limited threat to the United States, which is the so-called terrorist dirty bomb, and that just involves taking radioactive materials, maybe stole from a hospital, blowing it up. And it probably wouldn't be very deadly because most of the, the, basically, virtually all of the deadly radiation and radioactive materials that you get from a nuclear weapon comes from the blast. But when I say dirty versus cleaner nuclear weapon is some of the more sophisticated nuclear weapons are designed to minimize the types of nuclear reactions, primarily fission, for example, that create more long-lasting fallout that could make a place radioactive for years or even decades. Um, and instead, you have stuff that's that's radioactive and it, that largely fades within hours and days. It was like the what happened in Russia, their nuclear plant. Well, that's different. And Actually, they, reactors they, are quite right. dirty. But they still have they had all that fallout. The, so, the, so, so, so reactors yeah. are actually quite yeah. dirtier just because they have this fuel with relatively long half-lives and a lot more because the amount of fuel for a reactor, while it's not as concentrated as what you need for a nuclear mm -hmm. bomb, which mm -hmm. is very, very concentrated plutonium or the type of uranium that's unstable, which I think is U-235, but they deliberately keep it at a lower concentration because they need it to be more stable because obviously they don't want it to detonate in a nuclear blast, so what but there's more of it. So what happened? We had a good relationship with Gorbachev, and then we had a relationship with Yeltsin, well, okay, and then so, what okay, happened? So you had, now we got Putin. So, so what's you, the difference? Okay, so yeah. you had the Soviet Union that was collapsing, and on the eve of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the KGB and the Soviet Security Services wanted to foil the disillusionment of the Soviet Union. They didn't want it to disagree disintegrate. They wanted to keep it together as this continued, um, effectively continuation of the Russian Empire, though ostensibly under the guise of communism and Marxism. In fact, about um, 10 years later, when Putin was appointed by Yeltsin, he blackmailed Yeltsin most likely to be prime minister, his first speech was the greatest disaster of the 20th century was a collapse of the Soviet Union. So this is the way he was thinking in 1990 and, and the people and, like him. So what they were and doing. And this is still in his mind, isn't it? It's still in his mind. That he wants to put every, everything that collapsed before. Well, no, it's Humpty Dumpty. Yeah. He knows he can't create this massive thing all over again. And he doesn't necessarily need to, but the thing is he was against it completely unraveling. So what the KGB and other security services were doing was kind of terroristic attacks within the Soviet Union. There was still a Soviet Union, but elements of fighting broke out because the security services wanted to foil agreements slash treaties that Gorbachev was working on that would give um, greater autonomy. And some of their actions actually created a backlash. There was this apparent coup 
where they seized power briefly from Gorbachev, leaders of the security services led by the KGB, and they supposedly, although some people claim Gorbachev was secretly in cahoots, basically kidnapped Gorbachev and his wife at his dacha in the Crimea. He was on vacation, he was held hostage, there was a backlash against that, which actually sped and worsened the disintegration of the Soviet Union. But some of the things that they were doing in places like Georgia and Armenia and Lithuania, which were former Soviet republics, they continued after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, which are Baltic republics, and then later we added to NATO, we were able to secure. Other countries, they implanted peacekeepers, quote unquote peacekeepers. Um, and basically they claimed that they were trying to uh, protect ethnicities that were fighting. Mm -hmm. The Russians really wanted to maintain some element of control. They wanted to maintain their influence, so they implanted mm -hmm. in the early 90s, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, peacekeeping forces. So they said they're not trying to occupy them again, they're there as peacekeepers. But is it true, and, and no. Putin, was Putin one of the peacekeepers well, supposedly? No, no, I mean, he was, well, actually, he briefly left the security services. Yeah. He worked it, uh, for the city of P St. Petersburg through KGB and law school connections. He stole, he looted, he embezzled all the usual Russian mafia schemes. He's deeply connected to Russian organized crime. And he only returned later to FSB, which is the former KGB. And then he became ahead of that right before becoming the head of the KGB. But there's other people very... But then he, because sometimes he's president and sometimes he's prime minister. Well, he briefly became prime minister because there was a two term limit and he needed to wait until they overturned, you know, they changed the Russian constitution to give him, mm -hmm. allow him to have unlimited terms and basically be dictator for life. But he was <laughs> dictator for life. But he was appointed first prime minister in 1999 by Yeltsin. But there are other security thugs that are also involved here. So when they implanted their forces in various former Soviet republics, these became called frozen conflicts because what the Russians did by implanting their forces, they were able to stop any resolution of those conflicts. Mm -hmm. They were able to then have their forces already there so they could stir up trouble when they could. Now, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the military was broke. They, they basically couldn't even feel their ships. So they inherited this massive nuclear arsenal. They inherited this- Now when you say they're inherited, what do you mean, where are they inherited from? From the Soviet Union. So basically almost the entire Soviet military, the Russians took over, but as a blessing and a curse. And at first it seemed mostly a curse because they couldn't afford to, to fuel uh, these ships because originally the Soviet Union had like the second largest economy in the world. The Russian economy has largely declined. The 1990s were chaotic. Um, and for, in fact, just briefly fast forwarding to, to last decade, for a while Putin looked like this great economic leader, but that's just because oil prices briefly skyrocketed. And that gave them money, unfortunately, for modernization. So they couldn't handle this military. So we started to not really worry about the Russians. Unfortunately, we forgot that the Russians were not necessarily permanently out of the game. Um, our leaders, military and civilians, were naive. They thought that the Russians never wanted to fight us again. Um, and so what happened is you had a very chaotic time in Russia. We pushed rapid um, capitalist reforms, too rapid, that backfired. It was like called the big shock approach. What happened is the Russians didn't have the experience or legal infrastructure for fr private enterprise, so that failed. So the Russian transition to capitalism and democracy failed in the 90s. Meanwhile, you had Russian troops that were implanted in small numbers in various former Soviet Union, uh, Soviet republics to former Soviet republics in order to be ready to stir up trouble and then to take advantage. So when, it, so when Putin came in, there was a lot of, uh, there was, uh, the, the Russian economy was really falling apart. Oh, it was, but let me, let me, just, let me just add one thing. So in the 90s, our, we have to really but, understand, but, okay, so, we have to understand why Putin, how he became the way he was. Okay, so before yeah. Putin he said, took But I know he was KGB. No, no, but before, but, but be, before Putin took over, let me okay. just say, so there's two types of nuclear weapons. Strategic nuclear weapons that destroy cities and countries, okay. terrible things. Mm -hmm. And tactical nukes, which are for destroying aircraft carriers, mm -hmm. ships, tanks, armored personnel carriers, and, and artillery. Um, we don't have any treaties that cover Russian tactical nukes. That's why they no now have 10 times as many as ours. 
But we had treaties that covered the strategic nukes, and we wanted to make sure that they were able to comply with that. So we gave them the money to dismantle their nukes. We paid them to do that. In exchange, we got cheap reactor fuel, which ran out in 2013. Now, with their tactical nukes, we had a handshake agreement. Like, we don't really want to use it. We'll both eliminate it. We eliminated it. The Russians.